This uh, hearing of the Committee on Foreign Affairs will come to order. And we are again privileged to hear from Secretary of State John Kerry. Last year, Secretary Kerry spoke before our committee following a trip to Asia and dealing with issues related, related to uh, the North Korean regional crisis. Today, Russian regional aggression is at the forefront, and I am pleased that the House took a position and spoke very decisively this week, condemning Russian actions in clear and unmistakable terms. The U.S. has a strong interest in a democratic and prosperous Ukraine. To that end, the House last week passed important legislation to bolster the troubled Ukrainian economy. The Senate should move on this legislation today and leave IMF debates until later. While the committee is interested to hear about events in Ukraine, the purpose of this hearing is to question the Department's budget request for fiscal 2015. Needless to say, resources are tight and must be aligned with clear goals and objectives. This committee is responsible for oversight of how Department resources are spent, and we expect the Department to think strategically, not reactively. There is no margin for waste. There is no margin for abuse. And I am pleased that the Inspector General position was finally filled on a permanent basis after a five-year vacancy. Mr. Se Secretary, thank you for hearing uh, the request of this committee in acting. Last year, Secretary Kerry testified that the U.S. is the guardian of global security. Today, U.S. guardianship is frayed. Committee members are very concerned that Iran negotiations will leave the Iranian regime alarmingly close to a nuclear weapon. Syria, according to the United Nations, is the worst humanitarian crisis since Rwanda. Libya is failing and forgotten. In Egypt, we haven't pushed an economic reform agenda based on individual property rights that is desperately needed there. For Asia, a senior Pentagon official asserted the other week that because of budget constraints, America's high-profile pivot to Asia is being looked at again because, candid candidly, it can't happen. Mr. Secretary, as always, the committee stands ready to work with you on these and other critical issues. The Department must do a better job of holding foreign assistance recipients accountable, ensuring that they are meeting benchmarks for reform and development, especially in countries like Afghanistan, where so much has been invested. Our assistance is not an entitlement. It is a sign of our willingness to help others help themselves. Nor should foreign assistance dominate our relationships with partners and with our allies. This Committee's Electrify Africa legislation is an example of using assistance to improve the local e investment environment while creating jobs here in the United States, all at a cost savings to the American taxpayer. Our efforts abroad must be aided by robust broadcasting to help advance our national interests. The current media climate is crowded with state media, like RT from Russia and CCTV from China as well as non-state media, like Hezbollah's television station. These are our competitors on the ideological battlefield. And as former Secretary Clinton told this committee, right now we are losing. Reforming the Broadcasting Board of Governors is no longer an option. It is a requirement, and I am pleased to be working on legislation with my colleagues to do just that. Mr. Secretary, our nation faces many challenges and the difficulty of prioritizing is compounded by our fiscal crunch. Through it all, though, I look forward to working together to ensure that America maintains the leadership role we both support. And I will now turn to Ranking Member Engel for any comments, comments that he might have this afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing to review the Administration's fiscal year 2015 International Affairs Budget Request. Mr. Secretary, as Ranking Member, I want to welcome you. It's a pleasure to welcome you back to the Committee. I, I want to begin uh, by commending you for your tireless work on a wide range of critical issues. Your efforts underscore the great importance of continued U.S. engagement in the world and strong American leadership. At a time of crisis in the Middle East, Central Africa, and now Europe, 
The Internal Affairs Budget Request supports our diplomatic and development efforts in these and other regions. It provides critical funding to strengthen our allies, fight the spread of infectious disease, combat terrorism, and support many other essential activities. The International Affairs Budget also stimulates job creation and economic growth here at home. By helping countries build their economies and develop free markets, we make it easier for American companies to sell their products abroad. The budget request also provides critical resources to help ensure the security of our diplomats and development workers. These brave men and women serve on the front lines every day, and we must ensure there is adequate funding to keep them safe. Finally, the International Affairs Budget includes humanitarian assistance that reflects the compassion and generosity of the American people. While we cannot solve all of the world's problems on our own, we have a moral obligation to help ensure that hungry children don't starve, that refugees displaced by war or natural disaster have basic shelter, and that the poorest of the poor do not succumb to easily preventable diseases. Altogether, the international affairs budget accounts for less than 1 percent of the Federal budget. And let me repeat that. 1 percent of the Federal budget. In my view, that is a very sound investment in our security, economy, and humanitarian goals. Secretary Kerry, I know you agree with me that the United States must maintain its leadership in global health. However, I am frustrated to see that the budget request proposes significant reductions to numerous global health programs. I would like to work with you to ensure that we have the funding necessary to maintain the tremendous gains that have been made in the fight against HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis, and to address emerging threats like pandemic influenza. Mr. Secretary, on Ukraine, I believe we must continue to stand up for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and make it clear to President Putin that there will be serious consequences for his aggression. Chairman Royce and I are drafting legislation on Ukraine, and we look forward to working with you to ensure that the United States provides a robust assistance package to the new Ukrainian government and imposes appropriate sanctions against human rights abusers and those who are complicit in the violation of Ukraine's sovereignty. I am also deeply concerned about the ongoing crisis in Syria. Nearly three years after the start of the war, Assad remains in power and offshoots of al-Qaeda are growing stronger. Refugees continue to spill into neighboring countries, and we are all horrified by their stories of violence, torture, and starvation. Secretary Kerry, I hope you will use this opportunity to discuss the administration's strategy to end the terrible conflict in Syria. Back in 2004, when I was able to get past the Syria Accountability Act, we knew then that Assad was a bad player. We couldn't have imagined how bad he really is now. Iran remains the, among the biggest threats to our national security, even as negotiations resume next week with the P5 plus 1. I hope these talks succeed, but I agree with you that our engagement with Tehran cannot be based on trust. Iran continues to be a bad actor on many fronts, supporting terrorism, violating human rights, and souring instability in the region. We must keep that in mind as we negotiate on their nuclear program. I also want to recognize your efforts to facilitate a framework for peace between Israel and the Palestinians. There is still much work to be done, but you are helping to establish the foundation of what we hope will be a lasting agreement and I hope there is sufficient political will to take meaningful steps toward a two-state solution. Uh, I must say that the Arab League's uh, proclamation the other day that they will never recognize Israel as a Jewish state is very disheartening. In the meantime, I am glad that the budget request fully funds aid to Israel and provides for Israel's urgent security needs. And finally, here in our own hemisphere, I am deeply concerned by the Venezuelan government's crackdown on peaceful protesters and attack on press freedoms. And in Haiti, I am pleased that U.S. Reconstruction assistance has accelerated, and I thank Chairman Royce for expanding our committee's oversight in this regard. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to the Secretary's testimony. Thank you, Mr. Engel. This afternoon we are joined by Mr. John Kerry, the 68th Secretary of State. He began uh, in this post uh, and has been there just over a year now. Mr. Secretary, welcome again. And without ob objection, the Secretary's uh, full prepared statement is made part of the record, and members will have five calendar days to submit statements and questions and extraneous materials for the record. Um, and if you could uh, summarize your, your remarks, Mr. Secretary, we will soon face a, 
a short vote series on the floor. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate that. Thank you very much for the privilege of being here with you, uh, Ranking Member Engel, and to all the members of the committee. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be able to be here with you today. And I hope to please you greatly at the outset by giving you one of the shortest uh, uh, renditions ever. Uh, I just want to start by, by saying thank you to you all of you for your leadership, which is critical. We have a tough budget. Nobody needs to be told that, but it has serious implications. I just want to say to you that it's a privilege for me to lead the 70,000 plus employees of USAID and the State Department are all around the world. And we're including in that local employees who are critical to our ability to be able to function in the 285 posts around the world. Uh, these men and women serve uh, not in uniform, but at great risk. And they serve uh, our interests, our values, uh, and do an enormous job in, a, in an increasingly complicated world. What I would just say to all of you very quickly is, look, we spend one penny of the U.S. taxpayer dollar <clears throat> on everything that we do abroad in terms of our diplomacy in the State Department and USAID. It's all our development, all of our money, all the things we do for disease, anti-poverty, one penny on the dollar. Uh, I don't have to tell you, but I, I'll just say very quickly, I am amazed by the return on that investment. And increasingly, as I've traveled around the world in the course of the last year, uh, I have seen the degree to which people rely on the United States of America to be able to lead in instance after instance. And I say that without any arrogance, without any chauvinism about uh, you know, country. I say, as a matter of fact, uh, whether it's in Africa, Asia, South Central Asia, uh, the Middle East, uh, uh, throughout the world, uh, we uh, play a critical role. And this committee, needless to say, is critical in what it's willing to authorize with respect to our ability to lead. The final comment I'd make to you is that <clears throat> what we do uh, really does make a difference. And increasingly in the State Department, I have focused and am focusing the efforts of our diplomacy on economics. Uh, we need to understand that in this increasingly growing marketplace where more and more countries are chasing resources and opportunities are harder won, it's critical for us to be able to open up opportunities. Now, I could show you instance after instance where our embassies or our consulates have engaged directly with American companies help them win contracts abroad in the multi-millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, and that means jobs here at home. It also means more security for the United States, ultimately, because of the relationships we build. I appreciate, Mr. Chairman, your adjusting the schedule a little bit here. The President, as you know, <clears throat> has asked me to leave in a few hours to go to London and meet with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov regarding Ukraine. And he's asked to see me before I go. So I appreciate your uh, moving the schedule up slightly. I know you have some vote challenges here. So I will end on that. We'll submit the full testimony for the record. And I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, like you, we are focused right now on the Ukraine. And best of luck on your mission there. Uh, we have taken concerted action, uh, uh, clearly condemning this act of Russian aggression there. We've supported legislation to bolster the economy there and to, uh, uh, to take certain steps which I think will bring some leverage to bear. But there's one other step we could take that, in my view, would really give us a hammer over Russia. Fifty-two percent of the support for their military and their budget uh, and their government comes from their export of natural gas and, and oil into, you know, overseas. And most of that is their monopoly position that they have in Eastern and Central Europe. And it, it does seem that if the administration would move to allow the export of natural gas into the Ukraine, that that would send a powerful signal that we 
could indeed do something here that would produce American jobs. After all, we are flaring a lot of gas here. We are we're actually uh, uh, capping a lot of our wells. If we exported that specifically to that market, it might take time, but once we made that signal, uh, investors would uh, then put up, put up the, uh, the terminals necessary for us to do it, and it would go into the calculus in Moscow about whether or not they wanted to lose that position. And it might bring them to the table, and I wanted to raise that issue with you. Well, we are all for it, Mr. Chairman. And uh, in fact, the Department of Energy has the jurisdiction over this within the administration. They have issued six licenses already for 8.5 billion cubic feet per day uh, to be exported to uh, free trade and non-free trade countries, including Europe. So it's, uh, it's a possibility. Now, the first major project to export gas is not going to take hold until sometime in 2015. So, but, but since we are in March, Ukraine's needs are you know, such that they ought to be able to get, if, if there is any manipulation of gas with respect to leverage by Russia, Ukraine will be able to weather it. And in the long run, we are prepared, and I hope others will be prepared to help shift the uh, current energy dependency. I think that's great. I, those those uh, six have been over over a three year period, and it's only six. I think there's 24 pending. So anything that could be done to accelerate that and actually open that up for Ukraine and and Eastern Europe would be, uh, I think, very helpful. Another issue I wanted to ask you about was Iran. We had a situation where several hundred rockets, long range ones. Um, that would otherwise have threatened Israel uh, were intercepted. They were coming from an Iranian arms shipment, and they were headed to Gaza. And to me, that is a much better indication of Iran's lack, lack of good faith than anything they are signing at the negotiating table. But in terms of response to this particular violation, uh, which is actually a violation of a, of a UN uh, requirement there on Iran, what will be the response at the uh, U.N. Sanctions uh, Committee, and will the U.S. support additional terrorism sanctions as a result of Iran being caught in the act here uh, with this violation? Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, obviously we need to take uh, some kind of action, and uh, it has not yet been determined uh, precisely what. But let me just say, we worked very, very closely with Israel uh, in the uh, discovery and then ultimately the apprehension of this ship. And we didn't do it because we don't want to uh, create accountability. We, we want to obviously have the strictest accountability. So uh, it uh, is very much on the table. I can't tell you today what the decision will be, but I can tell you that we obviously take it very seriously, which is why we worked at it. And I don't disagree with you. It, it you know, it's, uh, it, it, it underscores the reasons why we are so determined to put in place a no nuclear weapon policy that is fail safe in our ability to be able to make those judgments, because uh, obviously there is a clash of other interests that will not be reconciled by any nuclear deal. Lastly, lastly Mr. Secretary, as you know, this committee has been at the forefront of the scourge of human trafficking. Uh, we have seen abuses involving fraudulent recruitment of people overseas. They are promised decent jobs in the United States, but they find themselves trapped into forced labor or into sexu sexual slavery once they get here to the United States. I have introduced legislation that would require State Department counselor official officials to glean more information and to share more information in order to get at uh, the schemes of the syndicates that misrepresent these positions. Uh, and I hope I, uh, that we could work together on this. Uh, I know you have been focused on human trafficking as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you for your leadership on this. Uh, it is really welcome. I have the privilege of chairing our, our all-government effort. The President has made this a major priority. And I chaired a meeting uh, last year in which we reviewed every single department's efforts with respect to human trafficking. 
Uh, it is nothing less than modern day slavery. There are millions of people who are the victims of uh, this uh, human trafficking. And it, it can be not just, it's not just, uh, uh, it is sometimes for sexual exploitation, but it's also for labor exploitation. And the marketplace is completely distorted and uh, violated by virtue of this practice. There are work slaves and sex slaves and other, you know, family help slaves, others, uh, it's, it's a disgrace. And your legislation and other efforts need to empower us. We need to call greater attention to it. We need greater law enforcement effort, greater awareness, education. Um, and so I appreciate your efforts on it, and we'll work with you very closely. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. We, we now go to Mr. Engel of New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, um, I had the, uh, the uh, honor of, of, of meeting with the uh, Ukrainian uh, Prime Minister this morning, and he uh, reiterated uh, to us that um, obviously the United States is indispensable in terms of Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's freedom and, and the aspirations of Ukraine to look westward rather than eastward. Um, an observation I've had for, for quite some time is that the European Union um, in its negotiations for um, affiliation with the Eastern Partnership uh, laid down a lot of uh, stringent uh, hoops that a country uh, like Ukraine would have to jump through before they could join, before they could get the aid, before they could get uh, whatever they needed. Uh, you contrast that with Putin saying, here's $15 billion, no strings attached, here's cheap energy, we're going to give you that. Uh, it seems to me that the, the EU has sort of failed in the past to, to really uh, even the playing field. And of course, we're dealing with these countries that are right on the cusp, not only Ukraine, but Moldova, but Georgia, um, Azerbaijan, Armenia to some degree. Um, does the EU finally get it? Uh, do they finally understand that, uh, that uh, things to, to make things uh, harsher uh, for these countries will only push them uh, into the arms of, of Russia? Um, are, we, are we now dealing with, with a more even playing field because of what's happened? Well, Congressman, um, let me begin by saying something that, that I think we need to think about as we approach this. And it's been one of the problems in the entire evolution of this uh, current situation in Ukraine, and that is looking westward versus looking eastward. We don't believe it has to be either or. We do not believe it's a zero-sum game. And part of the problem, frankly, that's led up to this has been this kind of insistence that you got to have all your eggs in this basket. No country should be doing that today. The, the marketplace just doesn't work that way. The world doesn't. We believe Russia uh, has interests and has an ability to be able to be important to the development of Ukraine, and so does Europe. And there's no reason why they shouldn't look in both directions. We do. We look east, we look west. We look north, we look south. And I think it's very important to be careful about those kinds of limits. Now, that said, uh, it is appropriate to require reforms and transparency and accountability and a, a progression by which countries begin to adopt uh, good governance practices and good uh, business practices at the same time. And that's really what uh, the standard has been with respect to accession, and we certainly are supportive of that. Do, but do we not risk, if, 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 if a government that, that is, is pro-West, and I, and I understand we, we want to make uh, Putin not feel that he's trapped, but I frankly would like Ukraine to look West. Uh, instead of looking east, are, are we not worried that if we if we um, put too many uh, uh, straitjackets on them of things they have to do, austerity measures and things like that, that we wind up uh, turning the the people against uh, the very government that we think is reform minded and and um, and pro West? Isn't isn't that a problem? No, something no we question. should be cognizant of. There's no question, Congressman, that there is a. Uh, there's a limit to sort of what you want to do all at one time. And indeed, you can drive people away that way, no question about it. Um, I mean, look how many years Turkey has been working to try to uh, you know, gain uh, EU accession and so forth. So I think that uh, 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 it seems to me that uh, there is a balance it's up to the Europeans to determine that balance, not up to us to try to dictate it or tell them what it ought to be. 
But it seems to me that when I talk about look east, look west, it's clear Ukrainians want to embrace the freedom, the choice, uh, the, the sort of competitive atmosphere, and the dynamics of social life and structure that come with the accession to the West. On the other hand, when I say look east, look west, I'm talking about sort of the economic bottom line, the economic opportunities, trading, uh, and so forth. And, and I think in today's world, uh, there are a lot of people in Russia who also <laughs> are, are looking in different directions. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, I, I mentioned in my opening remarks about the Arab League rejection of recognizing Israel as a Jewish state. That's a very disheartening because it would seem well, to me that there are, uh, that, that the way the stars have lined up, uh, that these countries should understand that Israel is not their enemy, Iran uh, is their enemy. And, and Netanyahu has said that um, that was, is a prerequisite of any kind of a peace deal. You've said it yourself, Mr. Secretary, that uh, they have to recognize um, Israel as a Jewish state. And, and let me say it's, it's a Jewish state, the, the national state of, uh, for the Jewish people, with equal rights for all citizens. We're not implying that there should be second-class citizens. But if they're not willing at this late date to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, which the um, United Nations Security Council resolution in 1947 uh, dividing historic Palestine into what it called a Jewish state and an Arab state. If 66 years later they are still not willing to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, then, then I don't know how we can make progress in these negotiations. Well, uh, Congressman, that's not the final vote. And uh, I've had plenty of discussions with all of the members of the Arab League. Uh, the formulation that you just articulated was not the formulation that was put to them for that vote. Uh, and so I will maintain hope for the notion that uh, when you talk about uh, Jewish state or nation state for the Jewish people or homeland for the Jewish people, it is always accompanied by what you said, which is with equal rights and non-discrimination with respect to any citizen. And I believe that if that had been uh, the vote, you might conceivably have a different outcome. Thank you. We go now to Eliana ross Leitonen <coughs> of Florida. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Welcome back, Mr. Secretary. Uh, it is disappointing that in your submitted written statement for today's hearing, uh, you failed to mention the ongoing over one month long crisis in Venezuela. The administration is condemning Maduro's use of force against the peaceful protesters in Venezuela, but voicing a concern is not enough. One of the opposition leaders, Leopoldo Lopez, was unjustly arrested and has been imprisoned, isolated in a military jail now for 24 days as Maduro attempts to silence dissent in Venezuela. Three more people died yesterday as a result of Maduro's violent suppression, bringing the sad tally to uh, two dozen dead since the protests began. Uh, the president issued an executive order that would impose sanctions against Russian officials responsible for human rights abuses. And I've written to the president asking that he do the same for Venezuela. Maduro continues to get help from the Castro regime. As you know, they've been sending Cuban troops to crack down on the Venezuelan protesters. Will the president hold these violators in Venezuela a responsible and sanction individual human rights abusers in Venezuela. And continuing with the theme of accountability, Mr. Secretary, I have doubts that accountability and oversight over the Palestinian Authority finances are, are actually taking place. As Ranking Member Engel just, sta just stated, Abu Mazen repeatedly reaffirms his refusal and unwillingness to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. He continues to pay nearly $5 million a year now the salaries of Palestinians who were imprisoned in uh, Israeli jails, many of whom have blood on their hands. In fact, just yesterday, as you know, dozens of rockets were fired at Israel from Gaza. So this serves as a grim reminder that Israel continues to be under attack. And in the West Bank, hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars continue to flow to the PA, wishing and hoping and praying that they'll do the right thing. What are you doing to ensure that the PA recognizes and accepts Israel as a Jewish state? Money is fungible, so 
one could say that U.S. taxpayer dollars are being used to pay the salaries of these terrorists? Would you say that that is true? And the administration is still seeking a waiver authority to fund agencies at the United Nations that admit a non-existent Palestine state. Abu Mazen has repeatedly reaffirmed that if the peace process fails to produce an agreement, the Palestinians will make a full-out push at the UN to get statehood. Uh, you said that withholding our money would not deter Abu Mazen, but I say that it very clearly could deter UN agencies, so we cannot allow this waiver authority to undermine the peace process. And in addition, I'd like to submit, lastly for the record, a letter to President Obama requesting that the administration consider giving those at Camp Liberty in Iraq the opportunity to receive political refugee status for those who are eligible. So sanction Abu Mazen and UN. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Well, Congresswoman, that's a lot to handle very quickly, but I'll try and do it as fast as I can. But uh, let me just say to you on the uh, issue of the oversight of the Palestinian Authority and their position on Israel, uh, we begin with the premise that everything we're doing in this negotiation begins with Israel's security, which has paramount, has to be uh, addressed. And I think Prime Minister Netanyahu would tell you that we have bent over backwards and are working extremely closely with him in order to, to do that. If now, we could just segue, I'm sorry, to, to Venezuela then, Mr. Yeah, but, but, but I want to finish one thing on that because it's really important. Um, on this, on, on, on the, uh, our position is that Israel has to be recognized ultimately as a Jewish state. But please remember, they're negotiating. Nobody's going to give up. I mean, you know, by the same token, Prime Minister Netanyahu doesn't stand up and say, hey, here's how I'm going to give you Jerusalem or something. Everybody's negotiating. And they aren't going to make those decisions until they know what they're getting in other respects. On the next issue of uh, the UN waiver, please, I, I got to tell you, this is a very one-sided event against us. Abu Mazen if he writes a letter to the UN, to 63 agencies, is automatically in them tomorrow. Automatic. He's an observer state. That vote was taken. 140-something to, I think, nine. 140-something to nine. Yet we tried in, in the budget to try to get the know, UN the but, money. But, but and I, that was wrong of us. What I want to explain to you is whether or not the United States loses its vote and gets punished for him going is irrelevant to him. He'll go because it's a tool for him to be able to do things he hopes that you know, make life miserable for Israel. But, Mr. Secretary, but we should us. not we fund UNESCO if they I'm, do that. I'm going, to make a, I'm going to make a suggestion. We should not fund UNESCO when they do this. We're, we're down well, it's, it's, zero time left in the vote. But if I can just say to you, Absolutely, we're not Mr. funding Secretary. UNESCO. We're losing our vote. We can't defend Israel in UNESCO. We can't defend any of our other interests. We're not there. We're gone because they went. And they'll go again if they think it's in their best interest. And who'll pay the price? The United States of America. We won't be able to vote. So I'm just saying to you, this is a wrong-headed effort for deterrence. It won't deter them. It will hurt us. We Thank believe you. we need And I waiver. hope we get to Venezuela in the last, next round. Thank you. No, but I'll just tell you, Venezuela, we're absolutely, in a, we, we need to, and we are, uh, not only speaking out, but taking steps. Vice President Biden was just down in Chile for the swearing in of the new president. We have met with a number of uh, neighbors, states down there. We are engaged now with trying to find a way to get the Maduro government to engage with their citizens, to treat them respectfully, to end this uh, uh, terror campaign against his own people. Uh, and to begin to uh, hopefully uh, respect human rights and the appropriate way of uh, of uh, treating us people, and we're we are think it's t we think it's time for the OAS, for the neighbors, for partners, and other international organizations to all focus on Venezuela appropriately, hold them accountable. This committee will stand in recess temporarily for the four votes, and we will return immediately after casting our vote on the last item in this series uh, to reconvene our proceeding. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, sir.
Without objection, I am going to go to Mr. Smith of New Jersey for three minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I will be very brief because we don't have much time. But first of all, Secretary Kerry, thank you for your work on behalf of the Goldman Act and your personal intervention for many years on the case of Colin Bauer. Uh, I had him sit right where you are sitting now, and he testified on behalf of the abduction of his children to Egypt. Uh, and thank you for helping that. The bill is now in the Senate. It was passed unanimously in the House, 398 to 0. And uh, hopefully it will not get hung up in any part of the process over in the Senate. Anything you can do to help would be deeply appreciated over on the Senate side. Um, we had a hearing on South Sudan, and um, Special Envoy Booth, Ambassador Booth, testified. Uh, some of our witnesses said that there is a need right now for a, a diplomatic surge, that th this could get much worse. It already is very bad. Uh, Salva Kiir and, and all the players there uh, need to hear from us even more robustly, if you could maybe comment on that. And, se and secondly, let me ask you, if I could, um, I have had four hearings on brain health-related issues, two on, on hydrocephalic condition as it affects mostly Africans. Some 300,000 children have a hydrocephalic condition. And a very simple intervention uh, developed by Dr. Benjamin Worf of Harvard, very inexpensive, can be rolled out very quickly in Africa. He's already at Cure International in Uganda, uh, saved the lives of 5,000 children, and they're now building up capacity as it relates to um, uh, training neurosurgeons. There are almost no neurosurgeons in Africa. In East Africa, there's one for every 10 million, to give an example of the dearth of, of surgeons. The other is the whole issue of Alzheimer's. We had two hearings on the global crisis of Alzheimer's that mirrors the HIV AIDS pandemic in terms of raw numbers. Uh, one estimate from, from one of our witnesses just recently was that we could be at 135 million Alzheimer's patients globally by the year 2050. Some put it lower at 115, but whatever it is, it's huge. The G8 summit was a step in the right direction. Uh, please work with us, if you would, on the issue of developing perhaps a global fund, not unlike what we did with the issue of HIV, AIDS, and the pandemic of, um, of uh, malaria and, uh, and TB. I, I'm almost out of time, so I'll yield to my our, our distinguished Secretary of State. Well, Congressman Smith, first of all, I, I really thank you for your continued passion on these kinds of issues. And um, as you know, one of your witnesses was a constituent of mine from my days in the Senate, who I worked with very closely when his children were abducted. And uh, it continues to this day. We're still working on this issue. We need accountability in countries on this issue. Uh, there are many, many more people abducted than, than anybody knows, taken away to a country of origin for a wife or a husband, one or the other, and uh, the American spouse is left completely without rights and without ability to access their children or child, um, and it's, it's a very, very painful thing, and I've seen the cost of it as you have. So I'll work with you, uh, obviously, on that legislation. I congratulate you for pursuing it. On the brain p uh, the research, et cetera, and, and, uh, uh, and uh, treatment, uh, of course, we'd be delighted to work with you. Obviously, the age-old question is going to be resource. We're already crunching up on some resources on the Global Fund and people who are dealing with that issue, which we've been at for 10 years plus now, with an amazing story. I mean, a million lives of children saved and so forth. It's quite extraordinary. But um, we're under resource pressure. So if you can help us with that here, um, particularly in the House uh, and in the Senate, we'll, we'll, we will be your ally and partner. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. We, um, we missed Mr. Sherman of California. We're going to go to him for five minutes. And then without objection, uh, so that we have time for the junior members to ask more questions, we'll go to three minutes per member. Um, I'll ask you see for that, and afterwards we'll go immediately to Mr. Mix. Mr. Mr. Sherman. Hmm. Mr. Secretary, as last time you were here, I've got so many questions that I'm just going to go through the questions and ask you to respond for the record, and then my last question will be one I'll ask you to respond to orally. Um, I've noticed that U.S. diplomats are far less knowledgeable and far less concerned about commercial matters than are the officials of other foreign ministries and other diplomats that I've had a chance About to deal with. Matters. Uh, commercial matters. And uh, I'm therefore pleased that you said that our diplomats had secured contracts for major American companies. In this room, I heard one of our very top diplomats boast as to how he had 
introduced the South Korean people uh, to the Crossfire automobile and urged that they buy it, uh, unaware that that automobile made by Chrysler or with the Chrysler name tag uh, was 98 percent German made. And so I would hope you would furnish for the record that what procedures we have so that our uh, diplomats are pushing for U.S. jobs and U.S. value added, not just U.S. companies. In response to Elliot Engel, you uh, put in kind of the accepting Israel as a Jewish state with rights for all people as uh, kind of in the same categories negotiating about Jerusalem. I'll point out that Israel has already made a very painful concession, and that is that there should be a sovereign Palestinian state, which is the home for the Palestinian Arabs, and I might add, probably won't have equal rights for all people. So I would hope that you would either persuade the Palestinians uh, to accept Israel as a Jewish state with rights for all, or alternatively, ba uh, suggest to our Israeli friends that they withdraw the concession that they've already made, that there should be a Palestinian state uh, that is a home for the Palestinian people until such time uh, as, uh, as the Palestinians make that same um, uh, concession our co-relative concession. Uh, as to Iran, um, the question I would uh, ha ask you to answer for the record is, how, if, what defines a bad deal? Would it be a bad deal if Iran had such stockpiles, such technology, and such centrifuges so that in a year of breakout they could produce a nuclear weapon? Um, my next issue is this committee uh, voted to provide a million and a, uh, that a million and a half dollars should be spent to communicate with the people of South Pakistan in the Sindh language. I don't think there's a more important uh, country for our national security uh, than Pakistan, and yet we face a lot of pushback from uh, from your department saying, "Well, it's just easier to communicate with Urdu." Um, if you're trying to sell something, you need to sell it in the language uh, of the, uh, the, that, is be that your customer wants to hear. Uh, I commend you se as Senator Kerry for your incredible record of fighting for recognition of the Armenian Genocide and hope that as Secretary Kerry uh, you will do likewise. And uh, of course it was the Azeri uh, soldier that murdered a sleeping Armenian soldier at a NATO exercise has been promoted and praised, and in light of that and other aggression, uh, I uh, hope that you would review and perhaps withdraw the idea of any military assistance to Azerbaijan. I hope that you would also warn the Azeris that it is simply outrageous for them to threaten to shoot down civilian aircraft that try to fly into the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, airport. Uh, the, the phrase pivot to Asia sounds wonderful when people think it means uh, trade delegations to Tokyo. I hope you would furnish for the record uh, how we can be sure that this doesn't mean that we take the eye off the Islamic extremists that have killed uh, many thousands of Americans and get captivated by fighting for rocks which are misnamed as islands uh, that have been uninhabited throughout uh, uh, human history. Uh, I hope that, uh, and, but finally as to the Ukraine, I hope that you would uh, make it clear that the Senate should pass the House $1 billion aid bill now because the plan to load up IMF reform, which I know you very much support, and put that on the back of the Ukraine bill, uh, threatens to delay that bill for three <laughs> legislative weeks, which I might add is six calendar weeks. And I don't think that, I think it's critical that we uh, provide uh, a billion dollars of aid, both for financial reasons and to make a statement. And I wonder uh, whether you could respond to that last one orally, uh, time permitting. Absolutely. But I want to take, uh, you, you pegged something that I don't want to leave any question about whatsoever. And I appreciate if you misunderstood it, I don't want to uh, leave it hanging out there. And that's on the issue of any equivalency between Jerusalem or the other. There is none. And it wasn't meant in that way. It was purely that there are bargaining cards everybody has. But you're absolutely correct. Uh, Jewish State was resolved in 1947 in Resolution 181, where there are more than 40, 30 mentions of Jewish State. In addition, Chairman Arafat in 1988 and again in 2004 
confirmed that he agreed it would be a Jewish state. And there are any other another number of uh, mentions, but those are the sort of the most important acknowledgments thereof. Uh, I think it's a mistake for some people to be, uh, you know, raising it again and again as the uh, uh, critical uh, decider of their attitude towards the possibility of a state and peace, and we've obviously made that clear. That's a conversation that will continue. But Jerusalem is an entirely separate issue to be resolved entirely separately and has its own set of uh, obviously deep uh, uh, concerns. And our position has been uh, pretty clear on that. So with respect to Ukraine uh, and uh, uh, the uh, aid, I want both. And I want them both now. But if I can't have one, we've got to have aid. We've just got to get the aid immediately. We can't be toying around here at a critical moment uh, for Ukraine. And so, um, you know, I know how things work up here. I don't want to get into the politics in between. But I do, to the degree I get into it, I want to say we need both. We need them now. Now, IMF, I know some people react, oh, my gosh, it's one of those multilateral deals and Boy, do we hate that, and so forth. Folks, countries that have gotten aid from the IMF are today donor countries in the world. They're contributors to IMF. They are reformed. They are open market economies. They're more accountable than they would have been. They're more democratic than they would have been. This is our lever for encouraging democracy. And this is our lever for creating transparency and accountability and mm -hmm. pricing reforms and getting rid of subsidies and creating an open market. That's how we've done it. And if you look dispassionately, non-ideologically, at the record of countries that have gotten it, it's an amazing return on investment for America. We don't spend money and lose money. So Thanks. I would urge people to do both, but, but boy, do we need aid for Ukraine, and we need it now. We will go now to uh, Mr. Meeks for three minutes, uh, followed by Mr. Rohrbacher of California for three minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, let me first uh, just say that I have been delighted to meet and talk to a number of members of the Chief of Mission who don't get nearly the recognition that they should for the work that they do around the world on behalf. Uh, they are just fantastic. Let me see if I can ask these questions real quick, uh, since I only have three minutes, uh, all over the, some of them are all over the place. One is, uh, you talked about we spend basically a penny on, on the dollar. Uh, what help would it give, uh, and as far as also influence in the region, when we talk about whether we're talking about TTIP and making sure that we're getting involved with our European unions on that deal, or TPP uh, and Asia, and does it, uh, with those kinds of deals, does it help or hurt the State Department? Uh, how are you moving forward? Does it help with our influence in those regions, or does it hurt us? So I would like for you to just to say, uh, because we have those two bills that, that may be before us sometime soon, but how does it affect with reference to the State Department? That is number one. But then going to more specific with the budget, uh, I noticed that, for example, in Colombia, uh, that the uh, assistance is being cut by almost $80 million. And as you know, that President Santos is close to uh, coming to a resolution with the Revolutionary Armed Forces. And so if their peace agreement is signed, it will be important to provide the Colombian government with support for demobilization and reintegration programs. And that's particularly important to me because a lot of that has to take place, especially in African Colombian areas where many of these individuals will be going back into. And so if we're cutting those funds, we could be devastating the individuals still in, those, in that country that needs the most help. So, uh, you know, that $80, $80 million is, is substantial. And lastly, uh, of course, uh, we had to downscale. There was a report that found that USAID uh, had to downscale by 80 percent homes being built in Haiti after the devastation uh, that took place there, the devastating earthquake. And of those 15,000 homes that was originally planned for construction, it was reported that only 2,600 and so were expected to be built. Uh, fortunately, I am told that reconstruction assistance has started to speed up with $1.4 billion of the now $2.4 billion dis dispersed. So my question just is, my last question is, how will the State Department further expedite assistance to Haiti? Well, let me uh, quickly uh, touch on all three. Uh, we absolutely want you to not just talk about but embrace uh, TTIP 
and the TPP. These are essential ingredients of American projection of power and our economic well-being in the future. And you know, you don't have to make a final judgment on the thing at this point. Look at the deal when it comes, and it's got to be one that passes muster. We understand that. But the fact is that if we can reach agreed upon standards for trading with 40 percent of the world's market in, with respect to Asia, the fastest growing market in the world, and 40 percent of the rest of the world's market in Europe, uh, which we have a commonality with in terms of our standards, et cetera, already, we are raising the standards globally of trade, increasing the opportunity for jobs and job opportunities for Americans, and revitalizing our own economic prospects, not to mention Europe's. So we believe in this very deeply, and we hope people will uh, see it as not just trade, but as, as security strategy, economic uh, strategy, job strategy, and so forth. On the issue of the cut to Colombia, it's very simple. Colombia has been successful. I, I can remember when I voted in the Senate for the first plan Colombia, and it was very controversial. And I voted for it. I thought it was the right thing to do, and now I think that's been borne out. So we've been very successful in Colombia. We have money. Uh, there's increased capacity and security and development capacity in Colombia. They're understanding that. There comes a time when success means we don't have to continue to necessarily fund something. Uh, and we're very supportive of President Santos's peace efforts. Obviously, we want that to be successful. Finally, on Haiti, uh, Haiti reflects money in the pipeline. And so we're being upfront with you. We believe we have some money in ESF and uh, uh, the Inkly that, uh, you know, once that money is reduced, then we'll come back and say we need some money for Haiti. So we're not reducing the effort. There's no reduction in commitment. It's simply that there is some money in the pipeline, and that should satisfy our needs for this year. Mr. Rohrbacher of California. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your hard work. We, we, we see you going all over the world working hard for us, and even if we have some areas of disagreement, uh, we respect and are grateful to you for, you know, working so hard for your country. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a couple of issues. Uh, first is the Camp Ashroff, yep. and you've got our friends here in their yellow jackets. Uh, it is very clear that they their group in Iraq have been attacked and murdered in great numbers and on several occasions, and that the current government of Iraq is either in collusion with <laughs> these murderers uh, or at least uh, they're turning their back and letting this happen. I have a piece of legislation, H.R. 3707, which would grant asylum to these people at Camp Ashraf who are obviously in danger. Uh, is the administration uh, supporting this concept and this legislation? Uh, Congressman, let me just say, first of all, uh, there is one solution to the problem of what is now Camp Aria, uh, formerly Ashraf, and uh, the, the answer is, and I have been concerned about it since I was a senator, we need to relocate those folks. Can, my yeah. legislation says relocate them here. Why not? We are looking. They're in danger. That's one of the things we're looking at. We've managed. I've appointed a special, uh, uh, special envoy slash uh, advisor with respect to this. He's a very competent counsel from here in Washington. He's been working on it full time. We, we need to get on this, uh, uh, Mr. That's Secretary. That's exactly what we're doing. Before and we have, more of them are dying. We have 210 who are now being transferred to Albania. We have another about 100 going to Germany. Okay. And we are now looking at the process here internally. We are working with UNAMI, with UNHCR, the government of Iraq, other relevant okay. authorities. But right now, the White House, Department of Homeland Security, and other relevant agencies are looking at how many we might be able I, to I would ourselves. hope that within 30 days, if, we, if all these things that you have talked about have not come to fruition, that we decide to act and bring them here so that at least they will be safe. Otherwise, the blood of these murdered innocent people are on our hands. Another issue, Dr. Afridi, the man who helped us bring to justice Osama bin Laden, who slaughtered 3,000 American citizens. Pakistan has arrested Dr. Afridi, and even now, after all of this time and all of these complaints and all of this negotiation, he is still in a dungeon. This does not speak well 
for the people who would side with the United States if we, we, we let Dr. Afridi, the ultimate hero in the fight against radical Islamic terrorism. My question to you is, number one, how can we possibly give the amount of aid you are proposing, uh, actually a billion point three in aid, both military and civilian aid, to Pakistan? How can we possibly uh, do that when they are holding Dr. Afridi which is a hostile act to the United States, and, and basically uh, so it's, it's an insult to those people who were died on 9-11. Congressman, uh, this is a very relevant issue that I have raised personally with the leadership of Pakistan. Uh, I believe at some point we're going to break through and, and justice will be done, which means he will be appropriately released and free to leave. Uh, but you say, how can we give the aid? Uh, we've got a lot of interests with Pakistan. Uh, it's a nuclear nation. Uh, we're trying to work with them with respect to nuclear restraint and also with India and, and other issues. Uh, we are conducting counterterrorism efforts in that country that are vital to us with respect to Al Qaeda. Uh, we are engaged in. Uh, major efforts. Uh, they've been very helpful with us, actually, in trying to work to bring the Taliban to the table, if that were indeed possible. There are lots of uh, efforts. All our, our, our basic supply line to our troops in Afghanistan starts in Karachi and goes through Pakistan. So these are the things that sometimes you have to weigh and balance. Uh, I believe the development of the country for many different reasons as a peaceful, stable democracy is very, very critical. They just had their first peaceful transfer of power from one president to another at the ballot box, the first time since 1948. Other times there have been coups and, and killings and imprisonments. This was a peaceful democratic election. And so I think uh, that it's important for us to think about the long term, not just one issue. But we raise and are pushing Dr. Afridi's cause. He should be free. We go now to Mr. Ted Deutsch of Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here today. Uh, this past Sunday marked the seventh anniversary of the disappearance of my constituent, Robert Levinson, from Kish Island in Iran. Monday marked Bob's 66th birthday, another birthday spent without his family. I know how committed you are, Mr. Secretary, to returning Bob to his family, and I thank you for your statement of support this past weekend. And I know that you and Under Secretary Sherman continue to raise this case when you meet with the Iranians. I would just ask that you please keep Bob at the highest priority level in all of your meetings and discussions with Iranian leadership. We must use every single opportunity to press for information and cooperation that will lead to his safe return. Uh, Mr. Secretary, as, as you know, uh, also in recent days, 60 rockets were fired from Gaza into southern Israel, some striking near schools uh, and libraries. Islamic Jihad, a militant group funded by Iran, immediately claimed responsibility. The attacks come just a week after Israeli officials intercepted an Iranian shipment of 40 short-range rockets, 181 heavy mortars, 400,000 bullets and dozens of M203 surface-to-air missiles bound for Islamic Jihad in Gaza. According to Israel's head of military intelligence, Hezbollah, an Iranian proxy, now has as many as 100,000 rockets uh, pointed at Israel and is actively engaged on the ground in Syria in support of the, Iran, the Assad regime. Iran has spent billions of dollars, arms, members uh, of its elite Quds force in Syria. And now, despite the parameters set forth in the interim nuclear agreement, statements reported out of Iran this week indicate that Iran may now be unwilling to discuss outstanding questions on the possible military dimensions of their nuclear program. According to the Wall Street Journal, Iran's deputy foreign minister made clear that there are no rush to discuss these issues, possibly in an attempt to force the P5 plus 1 to extend the interim agreement by showing adherence to other parts of the joint plan of action. Please assure us that the United States and our allies will not allow negotiations to extend beyond six months if Iran refuses to address the possible military dimensions of its nuclear program. And finally, Mr. Secretary, if you could just respond in writing to this last point, I am increasingly concerned that there is a uh, presumptive bias against young Israelis seeking to travel to the United States. Reports indicate that because of widespread visa denials, many student-aged travelers simply no longer apply to come to the United States. In fact, 
On Embassy Tel Aviv's website, there are videos warning young travelers about the risks of violating the terms of their visas. And while I understand that there are cases where the terms of tourist visas are violated, this does not mean that our policy should be to profile young Israelis and to arbitrarily, or as many have suggested, uniformly deny student-age Israelis, citizens of one of our closest allies, the opportunity to visit the United States. I would ask if the policy of presumptive denials exists with any other country, and I would appreciate you getting back to us in writing with the refusal rates of tourist visa applications by age from 16 to 30 over the past five years, and uh, I appreciate your being here. Happy to do so. Um, look, Israel is a vital partner of ours, obviously. In last year, over 100,000 visas of all ages were issued. Uh, 20,000 were issued to Israelis aged 21 to 30 in each of the last fiscal years. Issuance rates about 83 percent, which is not uh, different from other folks, other places. So. Um, we'll be happy to give you greater uh, input on that if you want it, um, but uh, I can guarantee you that visa applications are treated fairly and similarly in all places. Uh, with respect to um, the Gaza Hezbollah, it's a, it's a huge concern. Um, I don't know if it's 100,000 or 80,000. A few years ago, everybody was throwing around the number 40,000 in group 60. Definitely an increase, huge increase, huge threat, major problem, based in southern Lebanon and in the Beka Valley. Uh, and uh, Assad has been transferring many of these weapons to them, and they've come through Iran. So it's a double-pronged problem. It's one of the reasons why, when I came before you months ago, I was arguing so vociferously. Uh, that um, we needed to pay attention to this overall Syria picture because it's bigger than just the question of Syria. And this is an example of it. Um, and, and finally, on the Iran uh, negotiations, uh, we are working at defining those components of the uh, military aspects of, of the program, which we can legitimately fold under, and we're not going to ignore them. Warheads, for instance, are an obvious one, certain kinds of R&D, other examples. And we believe, we interpret appropriately, that the UN resolutions, as well as the joint uh, agreement, JPOA as we call it, both uh, allow for and call for addressing of certain of the military aspects of this. Now, some people assert that goes to every single class of missile or something. I'm not sure it would legitimately do that, to be honest with you. But certainly, warhead. And uh, there are military components of this that we're going to have to address in it. I'd, I'd uh, like to ask the members uh, to be cognizant of their time limit and leave the Secretary time to answer their questions within that allotted three minutes, because the Secretary is going to be forced to leave, as you know. Uh, he's, he's going to go uh, overseas due to the Ukraine crisis, and we'd like to be able to recognize as many members here as possible in our limited time. With that, we'll go to Mr. Shabbat of Ohio. Mr. Chairman, would it help you? I, I don't want to, I, I want to hear from as many members as possible, and if you like, I can take the question seriatim in, uh, and so that well, we can answer them for everybody. May, may, I, may I suggest, though, if I just stick to the clock, that might be the, the best way to go. Uh, and do that. Mr. Shabbat. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, the Secretary for his continuing focus on the Asia-Pacific region. I happen to be the chair of the subcommittee on Asia and Pacific. And uh, as the chairman knows, the chairman led a CODEL recently to that part of the world with Mr. Sherman and a number of our colleagues here. I think we learned a great deal, and it continued to show our engagement with that part of the, of the world. Um, and we have intended to hold a number of hearings about that and some other issues. Um, and, uh, and I'm not holding you responsible for this, Mr. Secretary, but we're having some trouble. Uh, I'm disappointed to some degree in the cooperation we've had with some of your folks. Um, despite repeat, I'll give you an example. Despite repeated requests, our staff's been unable to get a briefing on the fiscal year uh, 15 East Asia and Pacific budget. We've also been unable to schedule a hearing on North Korea uh, because of uh, lack of cooperation. and. Uh, uh, and I'm hearing similar concerns from others, and I know you can't be involved in the day-to-day -day ongoing, but if you could 
uh, check with your folks, and uh, if we could get some assurance that they'll cooperate on getting these things set up, I would greatly appreciate that. Um, secondly, a number of administration officials, including the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Acquisition, have recently made comments uh, that the rebounds to Asia needs to be reexamined. Uh, these statements come at a time when our regional friends and allies art articulate lingering concerns about the sustainability of increased U.S. engagement in the region, uh, especially with the administration's recent push to cut back on our military. Um, the East Asia uh, and Pacific fiscal year 2015 budget request states that one of the top strategic priorities is solidifying key bilateral relationships. Uh, and, and I would like to know what countries does that apply to, how you are going to solidify that. And finally, uh, and Mr. Royce already mentioned this, but I think it deserves uh, another mention at least. Um, it seems to me that from a U.S. perspective uh, that it would make sense for us to ultimately be a net exporter of liquefied natural gas. Uh, we could produce more energy to be exported to our strategic partners in Asia and Europe. And in the process, we could create more jobs here at home and more energy independence uh, and, and strengthen our bilateral ties with some of these important countries. Uh, and our European allies might not be so dependent upon the bully Putin. Um, so I would urge the administration to look into that. You already mentioned that, and I know you've got 27 seconds to address all three questions. So. <laughs> Uh, we will get the hearings done. I don't know what the uh, briefing, whatever the issue is, we will get to take care of it. With respect to the rebalance, uh, the 2015 request is $1.4 billion, which is an 8 percent increase over last year. So I don't know who is suggesting we are not going to do that. We are. I have made five trips already to the region. Uh, I was just there a couple of weeks ago in Korea and China. Uh, the President is going out there before very long. We are very focused. We are totally committed, and we are going to continue the rebalance. Now, uh, that is not going to come at the expense of Europe or the expense of other places. It is in addition to. We have to do more. We are living in a world where we have to do more. And, and it is a conflict, obviously, with where we are with our budget, and you all are going to have to wrestle with that as we go forward. We all are going to have to do that. We have got to talk about that. because. Uh, you know, it is critical that we project and, and remain active, and people want us to, particularly in Asia. South China Sea issues, the challenge of uh, rising China and the disputes in that area were critical to the free navigation and the peacefulness of that uh, area. So uh, I just want you to know that we remain completely committed to that. On the LNG, all for it. The one thing people got to look at, I don't have the answer to this. There is a point where our experts, our exports can get to a level where it has an effect on your folks at home in terms of price at home. And you got to look at what that differential is. I don't know where it is, but at some point uh, that could have an impact. We will go to uh, Mr. Higgins of New York. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, the the President's budget includes a $350 million increase for worldwide security protection account, which is obviously a good thing. I mean, protecting Americans as diplomats and humanitarian workers across the globe should be a major priority for our country. However, for those who have perished, uh, more must be done to secure justice. One such man, John Granville from Buffalo, New York, was a diplomat with the United States Agency for International Development. He was uh, promoting and working toward free elections uh, in South Sudan at the time of his death uh, six years ago. Uh, he was in the uh, Sudanese capital of Khartoum. Uh, four Islamic extremists murdered John and his driver. Uh, they were captured and they were convicted. However, they escaped from prison. Uh, two remain at large, and the State Department has issued a $5 million reward for information leading to their capture. Meanwhile, in February, the Sudanese government pardoned the man who helped them escape. The United States deserves better, and John Granville and his family deserve better. I have urged the President of Sudan to repeal the pardon and will continue to oppose efforts to delist Sudan uh, from the state sponsors of terrorism. Could you provide an update? Um, on the efforts to capture his killers, either verbally or through writing? Yes. Uh, 
the uh, two individuals who were alleged to have carried out this attack or carried out the attack have been designated by us uh, as special, specially designated global terrorist designation. Uh, they uh, were, they have been fugitives since the June 2010 escape from prison in Khartoum. And despite Interpol notices and efforts, they have not yet been captured. We want to encourage their recapture. And with the designation, we are trying to emphasize to everybody everywhere that we are going to pursue people and that justice will be done. For, and, and, and so we are committed that they be returned to prison and serve out sentences. And that is what we are trying to do. Okay, we go to uh, Mr. Joe Wilson of South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for taking the time and speak with us today about the President's budget for the Department of State. Clearly, this is a chaotic and dangerous time for the Department as America faces many challenges around the world with the Benghazi murders still unsolved. While we have you here, I share in everyone's concern about the ongoing situation between Ukraine and Russia. Peace is threatened by President Putin's regional aggression. I believe it is of paramount importance that the United States exhibit strength and determination toward the Russian Federation. However, the disastrous decision by the President and his budget to halt progress on the mixed oxide fuel fabrication facility, the MOX facility, at the Savannah River site will allow the Russians the option to stop disposition of 34 metric tons of excess weapons grade plutonium. Over the weekend, USA Today ran a story in which Secretary Ernest Moniz of the Department of Energy commented, quote, at the right time, end of quote, the U.S. will have to reengage in plutonium disposition discussions with the Russians. He went on to say, quote, now may not be the right time, end of quote. My question is, when will we be, will we be able to have these negotiations? Uh, if we back down on our end of the agreement, what assurances do we have that Russia's excess material won't end up in the wrong hands? Uh, it's, look, that is an excellent question. I, I honestly need to, uh, uh, I need to uh, get deeper briefed on exactly what that decision was, how it was made, and why. So let me find out, and we will get back to you. Well, thank you so much, because this is crucial. And uh, indeed, I was very grateful. The uh, Aiken Standard uh, local paper at home, Derek Asbury, on Saturday, wrote from the World Nuclear News that Russia is moving forward in constructing a fast reactor that will dispose of the high-grade uh, weapons-grade plutonium. But at the same time, uh, we are uh, apparently uh, ceasing our activities with uh, the uh, closure of MOX. And so th this is just uh, an issue that should be addressed. And I appreciate you looking into that. Additionally, uh, in the past week, uh, we have had where the Iranian uh, foreign minister said that it was an illusion uh, that uh, there would be the end to um, enrichment uh, activities by Iran. Additionally, we had uh, Israel seize uh, a ship which had uh, long-range rockets. Uh, it was an Iranian shipment to Hamas, terrorist, uh, in Gaza. Uh, in light of that, and I agree with uh, uh, Ranking Member Elliot Engel, you can't trust Tehran. And we know the young people of uh, Iran uh, want to live uh, in a uh, non-tyrannical society. Why shouldn't we be um, reinstituting and pushing for harder sanctions in light of what's just happened in the last week? Well, as you know, we do sanction Iran for other activities other than nuclear. And there's nothing to suggest that we shouldn't uh, take a step with respect to that. We sanction them for state sponsor of terror. And they're already sanctioned under that, and this fits under that banner, obviously. So we're not, uh, we haven't said no. Uh, we, we, you know, we're still trying to get, we have to get to the bottom of what's in it, how much all this kind of stuff, and where it came from, and tracking, uh, because you have some fairly rigid standards that have to be applied legally when you make that uh, determination. Um, but that said, uh, let me come back to a comment you made about uh, the ship and the overall issue of Iran uh, and not trusting them. I've said before, and I really want to emphasize to everybody here, nothing that we're doing with respect to this negotiation is based on trust. 
I have said, in fact, I've quoted, I said, Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. Our motto in this instance is verify but verify. We're going to, we're asking for the deepest, most extensive uh, verification, inspection, accountability measures that have ever been put in place with respect to ascertaining what they're up to. So I can assure you, whether it's a ship or elsewhere, we're going to be uh, pressing very, very hard for the insights necessary to ground and, and, our security. And we will study we'll, we'll, about we'll, the missiles and have a determination about these missiles? Beg your pardon? We will have a study about the missiles and a determination? We'll a, I, we, we will make a determination. I can't tell you what, you know, I, I haven't reviewed all the options yet. I have not had a proposal put on my desk, and I haven't put one on the President's. But absolutely, this kind of behavior is not appropriate and unacceptable. William Keating of Massachusetts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to thank the Secretary, and I'd like to thank Assistant uh, Secretary Newland uh, for your leadership in Europe and Eurasia, uh, including Ukraine. Now, I recently uh, introduced a resolution uh, with Congressman Poe uh, to encourage Georgia's inclusion into NATO's membership action plan. And I appreciate uh, your efforts, Mr. Secretary, and the Administration's efforts to support this goal. That being said, given what's happening in Ukraine and what's already happened in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, do you think that this is the right moment to actively push some of our European partners towards this goal? Uh, second question, if I could. Uh, I'm also concerned about the often violent situation in Belfast over the past year and the failure of the five parties to agree to a December 2013 draft of a Northern Ireland peace accord. Uh, what are your thoughts on the draft of the Northern Ireland uh, peace accord and the rationale leading the State Department's decision to eliminate funding for both the Mitchell Scholarship Program, which I know you have been a stronger supporter of, and the International Fund for Ireland? Well, we're going to look at, we're looking at the, internet, at the Fund for Ireland piece of it, because I think that, uh, you know, we have uh, our friends from Ireland coming in this uh, Friday for meetings tomorrow. Uh, I won't be here to take part in them, but uh, we're going to be reviewing where we are with respect to the current impasse. Uh, and things have come, unfortunately, to, uh, you know, a little bit of a standoff, stalemate, if you will, on further implementation of the uh, peace process. So we need to take stock, renew our commitments, get back on track, and it may be that the fund is going to be an essential ingredient of doing that. We've got to make that determination. Uh, on your question about uh, Europe uh, pushing them towards the goal, I missed, I apologize, I didn't hear what goal you were talking about. The goal about uh, Georgia's uh, advancement into the membership action oh. plan with NATO. We're, we're continuing. The, those are all under review and under a constant process of uh, uh, helping those countries to be able to meet the standards that are available. Now, when you say pushing them, they, they've got to do their own set of, of, of decision making in order to meet the standards. And they're, they know what they are. People are working with them. But there are government reforms, there are accountabilities, certain standards, different things have to happen uh, for that process. And that's been salutary for those who have made the leap and joined. And it's uh, very much open to them at this point in time. There are a whole bunch of people, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo, and so forth, the Balkans, where this is true, and uh, other places uh, like Georgia. Thank you. Yield back. We'll go now to Mr. Ted Poe of Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, uh, uh, I'm concerned about a lot of things in three minutes. I'm going to try to get a couple of them and let you have the rest of the time to answer. Pakistan, we give them money. They persecute the Baluch. And they have for a good number of years. Uh, Mr. Robacher and myself and other members are very concerned about the persecution of this uh, uh, group of people. Uh, as Mr. Keating pointed out about Georgia, uh, the Russians have first moved into Moldova, then Georgia. One third of the country is taken by the Georgia or by the Russians. Uh, now the Ukraine. Uh, and the third concern I have is about the MEK. Uh, when you were here in April last year, since you were here then, I talked to ask you questions about it, then again in December, uh, there have been uh, 62 members of the uh, MEK in uh, Iraq uh, that have been murdered. Uh, the question twofold. Ukraine, were we surprised that the Russians moved into the Ukraine? If not, when did we know the Russians were going to invade another country? And then on the MEK, 
when is the State Department going to make a decision to allow members of the MEK that are stuck in Iraq to come to the United States? When will that decision be made? Those are my two questions. Well, that decision is, is under review right now. As I said earlier, you may not have been here. You may oh, I, I know that you, what you said earlier, that it's under review, but when are you going to decide to make the decision to either allow them well, to come in Homeland, or not come in? Homeland Security and the White House and other agencies, uh, Justice, for instance, are engaged in an analysis of, uh, you know, whether or not that can be done based on our judgments uh, with respect to how many and whether it works. So, you, is, Are you going to require or not they renounce their membership in the MEK as a condition, precondition? Uh, I, I, I don't know the answer to that yet. Okay. Uh, I, I think the key is to make uh, certain that we're following the standards and procedures by which people are admitted to the United States, and that takes some vetting and so forth. Now, there are urgent circumstances here, and I've acknowledged those. Their safety is at risk, no question about it. And we want to move them out of uh, uh, Iraq as rapidly as possible. That's one of the reasons why I've appointed somebody full time to be working on this. We've gone to a number of countries. And, and frankly, I'll be very upfront about it. One of the th reasons we're urgently now reviewing this is people sort of say, well, how many are you taking? And that's an appropriate question to ask, and it deserves an answer. Excuse me, Mr. Secretary, claiming my time in the last 20 seconds, when did we know about the Russians' in invasion of the Ukraine? Well, we knew about their movement of troops in there the minute it began to happen. But they have a basing agreement. And under their basing agreement, they are permitted to have up to 25,000 troops there. Uh, they currently have somewhere in the vicinity of 20,000 or so. That's including the increase. So they were perfectly within their limits of their base agreement. And in the initial stages, in the inquiries that were made of them, that's what they said. We're moving because we have threats against some of our people. We're not planning to do X, Y, or Z. We're not going into East Ukraine. It's not an invasion. And obviously, that has evolved. And so, you know, fait accompli. We understand what it is. And we understand exactly how, you know, what they've done, which is precisely why the President has already, <coughs> excuse me, already issued an initial set of executive orders and created visa bans. And if we are not successful tomorrow in finding a way forward, uh, and the referendum, which we all anticipate, which is going to take place on Sunday, is done without some path forward, there are going to be serious repercussions. So that's where we are. Uh, the President has made it clear we take this very, very seriously, as do, I might add, all of our European uh, partners. I was on a conference call with my counterpart foreign ministers this morning, and they are united and strong and determined that there will be consequences if we cannot find some way to uh, diffuse this. David Cicilline of uh, Rhode Island. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your uh, extraordinary service to our country and for your uh, being here today with our committee. I'm going to submit a series of written questions uh, that relate to Armenia, Nagorno-Karabakh, and Azerbaijan uh, to the largest <coughs> Air Force Base and the U.S. Consulate in Punta Delgada in the Azores. Uh, some questions relating to the Middle East peace process, uh, our national ocean policy, the importance of continued attention uh, to defense sales, and finally to the State Department's ongoing efforts to protect the human rights of LGBT individuals around the world, especially in countries such as Nigeria and Uganda. So I'll, I'll do those in writing. And I would just ask you, uh, in the time that I have, to really comment on two areas. One is uh, US, UN peacekeeping uh, functions. As you know, we are at least $350 million behind in our peacekeeping dues for fiscal year 2014. Uh, your budget proposal brings us closer to fulfilling our financial obligations to UN peacekeeping. Um, but if you could just speak to the importance of this funding and how our arrears uh, impacts on our ability to pursue our interests at the UN and around the world. And the second uh, issue I'd like you to touch upon is, uh, as you know from uh, certainly your long service in the Senate, uh, we and other developed countries jointly committed in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change to $30 billion in assistance between 2010 and 2012 to help mobilize $100 billion in public and private funds by 2020 to address 
the causes and the impact of climate change. Uh, after that, the United States elevated uh, climate change as a development priority, and I wonder if you would speak to how your budget reflects those priorities and might uh, help us realize those objectives. In one minute and 12 seconds. <laughs> Well, uh, I apologize. Abby, uh, we're, we're extremely focused at the climate change first. We're, we're extremely focused on the climate change. We have money uh, for research for mitigation uh, efforts. Uh, and we are gearing up, as you know, I just came back from China where we agreed to jointly work together in order to set the target dates for 2015. And the President is laying down his climate action agenda. It's an all government effort. So the budget actually doesn't reflect everything because every department is being called on to do things with respect to climate change. On the issue of the UN peacekeeping, uh, the request that we put into you is $753 million above uh, the, the 2014 request, and that's primarily because of increases to meet our commitments from Mali, Somalia, South Sudan, uh, in addition, we have to fund all the missions at the UN assessed rate, which is 28.4 percent, not the 27 point something percent we pay. So there's a gap. And finally, uh, we're adjusting for one-time offsets that are being used to cover our bills uh, this time. There's $218 million for that. So we're pulling out down on some of our peacekeeping east to more. Uh, Liberia, Haiti, Cote d'Ivoire, and several others, um, as the troop levels decline and as the need declines. But we have increased efforts in Africa and a number of different places, uh, the Central African Republic, the uh, um, uh, Great Lakes region, uh, South Sudan, and so forth. So the demands from the UN have grown, and the money has gone the opposite way. Matt Salmon of Arizona. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, it is uh, it's my honor to serve as the subcommittee of the uh, Western Hemisphere uh, uh, subcommittee on this uh, full committee. And as such, I'm, I'm deeply troubled by the lack of clear vision and strategy in the region. Don't get me wrong, you have many skilled diplomats operating throughout the region, but I fear the lack of coherent strategy and appropriate engagement comes from the top. In the last year, Cuba has been caught red-handed, violating U.N. sanctions and shipping weapons to North Korea through the Panama Canal. Venezuelan opposition leaders and students are being imprisoned without charges, and demonstrators are being beaten and even killed by government forces, all for opposing Maduro's fa failed economic policies and the overall dismal state of their economy. Ecuador and Bolivia have booted out our USAID missions, and our diplomats are inexplicably walking on eggshells for constant fear of expulsion. Drug trafficking and violence through Central America continues to increase, and the Russians have docked a warship in Havana's harbor. These are just a few of the events happening in the Western Hemisphere. Meanwhile, the Administration's <coughs> response to these regional challenges has been muted at best. Attempts to utilize our membership with multilateral organizations to hold these regional bad actors accountable have not been successful. In the case of Venezuela, the Organization of American States by the way, uh, American taxpayers fund at least 40 percent of their operating budget, issued a shamefully weak statement on the violence happening in Venezuela and did nothing to oppose the human rights violations happening there or to support the demonstrators' right to freedom of expression. Given the ineffectiveness of the OAS, I am not sure I can justify to my constituents continued funding for such a feckless organization. Furthermore, the U.N has had to take a strong action to punish the Cubans for violating U.N. sanctions and selling the North Koreans' weapons right at our back door. I was recently heartened by the U.N. report that was recently released on this incident, but I strongly urge you to make sure that Cubans pay a significant price for thumbing their nose at international sanctions. Meanwhile, as Central America struggles with increased drug smuggling activity and the corresponding violence, USAID, USAID is helping Guatemala by buying them solar panels. Really? To wrap up my point, Mr. Secretary, we need a better strategy in the Western Hemisphere and a renewed engagement and understanding that our national security is on the line if we don't start paying attention to our hemisphere. I hope you will take this on board and then share with us what that vision will look like and how it advances our national security. Finally, uh, recently you, you stated in a, spe in a speech that uh, climate change is increasingly a national security threat. 
with all due respect, Mr. Secretary, given everything that is happening around the globe today, do you really believe that? I would submit to you that around the world, liberty and economic freedom are being threatened by tyrants, and those yearning for freedom are, lo are looking to the U.S. for leadership in, de in defense of liberty. But instead, USAID is offering solar panels. I believe that is an affront to the U.S. taxpayer and an insult to those seeking freedom around the world. Well, Congressman, freedom also means the freedom to be able to eat and live where you live. And we have people who have just come back from meetings in the Pacific Islands where they are losing that ability because of the level of now high tides that regularly destroy their homes and flood their communities. Now, freedom means the freedom to eat and have food. And increasingly, food security is at risk because of global climate change. The fact is there are countries that are going to run out of water. And there are nations that may have wars over water. There will be climate refugees in various parts of the world. There already are people fighting over water in places like Sudan and elsewhere. Uh, you know, the, 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 the fact is that uh, everybody has a right to the preservation of the ecosystem of the planet of w from which we live. You wouldn't have life on this planet if it weren't for the oceans. The oceans are increasingly at risk, at least the ecosystem within them. Fisheries overfished, unbelievable acidification taking place because of the pollution that goes into the ocean. So I, I just say to you, you know, there's a reason that General Zini, who used to be our CENTCOM commander, stood up and said climate change is a national security issue. There's a reason that the Pentagon, until recently for budgeting, had an office to deal with this issue, to make plans for the future, for the changes that are going to take place in terms of security. You know, uh, there are all kinds of implications. So I, I strongly urge you to recognize that if the things continue to happen that are already happening, as a matter of scientific fact, not my imagination, when countless scientists come together and all agree that X, Y, and Z is happening and happening now and happening to a greater degree than it was before and faster than they predicted, you ought to step back and look at it. And, and you know, the worst that can happen to everybody in the world if, if I'm wrong and Al Gore's wrong and scientists are wrong and the UN is wrong and countless communities are wrong is that we make a decision to have cleaner air, better health, you know, more jobs, new energy, energy independence, that's what happens. But if the guys who say it isn't happening are wrong, life as we know it on this earth can literally end. So you got a choice, and I think it's pretty clear where the President and I are putting that choice. Is it a, 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 an instrument of destruction on a global basis? I was in the Philippines where Typhoon Hanan hit, Haiyan. And I will tell you, man, I have never seen devastation like that wreaked in as few a minutes. And what happened to the trees stripped off the mountaintops and, and the entire community, several hundred thousand people displaced. So we have to pay attention to it. And that's, that's where I'm coming from. Let's go to uh, Mr. Grayson of Florida. Mr. Secretary, if a free and fair election were held in the Crimea between being part of Russia and being part of the Ukraine, what would be the result? A free and fair election? Well, that's a that's a that's a uh, oxymoron right now. Anyway, well, try when you're invaded anyway. by twenty thousand troops, and you're, you know, I have no doubt that people would vote for a greater affiliation with Russia. There's no question in my mind about that. But you can't consider an election in in the face of troops and hastily put together in a few weeks without any debate, and also contrary to international law and contrary to the Constitution of uh, Ukraine as a free and fair election. Well, hypothetically, if 90 percent of the people in the Crimea wanted to join Russia, what does that tell us about U.S. foreign policy in the region? It doesn't say anything about U.S. foreign policy. It says everything about history and culture and language and what they're believing. Uh, it's not a reflection of U.S. foreign policy. It's a reflection of a relationship that's existed for centuries. Ukraine used to be part of uh, uh, Russia for centuries. It's only been part of Ukraine for 20, uh, Crimea, only part of Ukraine for 22 years, uh, whatever it is, I mean, it, you know, formally, and, and, and uh, a little longer than that, excuse me. It's only been formally, because 1954, Khrushchev gave it to Ukraine as a, quote, gift, but it was ratified and approved and 
subsequently passed on by the uh, Duma in Russia formally accepting that. So uh, there's no doubt that they feel a huge tie to Russia. That can be reflected and respected without invading, uh, uh, you know, with uh, your troops and having an election at the point of a gun. Does the U.S. have any vital national security interest in seeing whether Crimea is part of the Ukraine or Russia? I think we have a vital national security interest in upholding international law and in upholding the norms for international behavior and not allowing somebody at the point of a gun to reverse uh, settled lines of nations and to reverse the constitution of a democratic country and a country aspiring for greater democracy. Yes, I think we have a vital interest in that. But there is a difference as to whether it is an interest that rises to the level of you know, deploying troops versus deploying economic uh, measures and other kinds of choices that are available to us. Well, tell us how you draw that line. Well, uh, I, I draw that line. Uh, do we believe that uh, a nuclear war is worth fighting over Crimea? That would be a very tough question to resolve. I think most Americans would resolve it fairly fast. Uh, but on the other hand, most Americans would also agree very quickly nations should not behave the way Russia has, and they ought to pay a price if they choose to. Is the principle of self-determination in play here? It could be if it were done properly. An example of that would be what has taken place in, uh, what is going to take place in the United Kingdom, where the Parliament has approved the right of Scotland to have an independence uh, uh, referendum. But it's been done through the appropriate mechanism. The Constitution of Ukraine requires that any effort by any entity within Ukraine to secede be done through the constitutional process. If Russia were to say, we think they ought to have additional autonomy, ought to be respected, the affiliation with us ought to be more clearly defined, there are plenty of ways for us through UN, through uh, multilateral efforts, through Ukraine-Russia discussions to find out if there's an appropriate way to resolve that. Jeff Duncan you don't do it. You don't do it. I mean, we, 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 in the 19th century and 20th century, we learned the way to do it is not by invading a country and forcibly arbitrarily changing those lines. Jeff Duncan of South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, you have been clear about uh, your opinion regarding Iran's nuclear ambitions, but you haven't been clear about uh, your position with regard to Iran's activity in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, specifically, there was a bill signed by the President in uh, late 2011 dealing with countering the Iranian threat in the Western Hemisphere and uh, a report that was put out by the State Department. And um, specifically, um, do you believe that the Argentine prosecutor Alberto Nisman's report on the AMIA bombings uh, in the 1990s should be uh, taken in consideration uh, by the State Department as they reevaluate the Iranian threat here in this hemisphere? Well, anything that is relevant to the Iranian threat in the hemisphere ought to be taken into account. And um, uh, we have been looking at this issue of Iran in the Western Hemisphere, and there are uh, there is some evidence, obviously, of that. Uh, and they have been playing for a certain period of time. It is not clear if that has grown uh, at this point or continuing at the same level. But this gives me a chance to come back to uh, the question earlier about, about the hemisphere in Venezuela and so forth. Look, I have been, been in this job now for about, just over a year. And my initial effort when I went down to the OAS meeting and uh, have engaged was to try to meet with the foreign minister of Venezuela and, and sort of say, you know, what are we really fighting about? We're for health care, you know, assistance for your citizens. We're for economic transformation. We're for freedom of speech, these kinds of things. We ought to be able to find some means of uh, cooperation. And there was an agreement to sort of begin that tentative effort to try to see if we could find common ground. Next thing we knew, uh, bad habits were being pursued again, and uh, the folks in Venezuela were simply lobbing grenades, uh, you know, 
uh, figurative diplomatic and political grenades at us, ideological grenades. Yes, sir. That is what concerns me about the bad habits, because Mr. Nisman in Argentina points specifically to Hezbollah and Iran's activity with being attributable to the bombings there in Buenos Aires that killed uh, Argentine and Jewish and, and um, uh, other lives. So uh, are you familiar with the report, and do you think the State Department ought to I have not read the report, no. Okay. Uh, um, I appreciate it. And I would ask that the that, uh, State Department circle back up with me on yeah, that. Let me just ask a, a question on a different line because I'm concerned about Argentina. And they're uh, seeking to reopen the spigots of international aid without doing anything to solve the bigger problem, and that's that its policies remain hostile to meaningful private investment. And so my question uh, in the remaining time is what are you doing to urge Argentina to meet its obligations and settle with its creditors? We have been urging them to do exactly that. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we've, we've, as you know, been amicus brief on a number of different uh, cases. We are pressing very hard to see that they do that. Okay. They Thank have you. a responsibility to do it. They owe about 600, I think it's about 600 million dollars a road to us, our folks, and we are working on a way to uh, deal with their. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. I appreciate that, and I, and I hope the State Department can continue to be more forceful with that. Bradley uh, Schneider of Illinois. Thank you. And, Mr. Sec Secretary, thank you for being here. As you said in your opening prepared remarks, what we do in the world matters. And uh, what you and the people on your staff and team do uh, here and around the world are, are crucial. Uh, we are here talking about the fiscal uh, year 15 budget. Uh, however, global affairs don't necessarily follow a fiscal year calendar. And there are three deadlines looming in the, in the coming months that I think are incredibly important. First, in this spring, the uh, negotiation, current round of negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians. June 30th is the deadline for the removal of chemical weapons from Syria. July 20th, we then see the conclusion of the six months on the joint plan of action with Iran. And at the same time around that region, we have a, a series of, of very concerning trends with Egypt and, and its government, the chaos in Sinai, the pressures on Jordan because of Syria, what is happening in Turkey, even what is happening in sub-Saharan Africa leading to refugees in, into the region. So my questions in, in, in a very brief amount of time is all of these deadlines, whether they are successful or unsuccessful, and the, the assumptions are 50-50 in, in many cases, are going to have serious implications and financial demands, fiscal demands on, on the United States and the world. Do you believe that the budget as, as proposed here for fiscal year 2015 provides the resources and flexibility for the State Department for you to do what is necessary for a successful outcome? Uh, Congressman, that is a terrific question, uh, well thought through in terms of noticing the confluence of all of those dates. You are absolutely correct. Big things are potentially going to happen all in short order, uh, one way or the other. And uh, the answer is profoundly no. I don't believe we are adequately resourced, but, uh, you know, this is the best budget we can get under the circumstances of the budget deal that was cut up here. It is not the budget we need. So, thank you. Let, let me. And I will just say to you, if we are successful, if we can move forward on Middle East, uh, that is going to require some real thoughtfulness up here about how we are prepared to support the Middle East peace process. Let, let me ex extend on that as, as we do move forward. Um, I hope, and I, I know I'm joined by my colleagues here, that with the negotiations with the Palestinians, that paramount, as, as has been said before, the security of Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people, that the joint plan of action is an interim deal that does not become a permanent deal, and that we as a country, the United States, remains fully committed to ensuring that Iran does not achieve its goal of a nuclear weapons capability, and that all, all um, options remain on the table in that respect, and that the um, status of chemical weapons in Syria uh, by, by June 30th is, is dealt with and, and dealt with directly. And finally, if I can, my last second, uh, echoing some of the other things that have been said, ask for uh, your follow-up on the uh, status of visas for Israeli, young Israelis of, of student age. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we will go to Mr. Mr. Kinzinger of uh, thank Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here. Uh, you keep up a very intense schedule, and it is going to continue today. And so I want to thank you both for your service in the past in uniform and your long service as a civilian. So I want to say that. 
I want to make a couple of points with a question. The first point I want to make is to remind everybody that, uh, to an extent, and the situation in Ukraine was created by the Russians a long time ago. And so now when they claim that they have these interests of people in eastern Ukraine, that was a situation created by them. I was shocked to hear a colleague earlier actually seemingly defend the uh, actions of Russia, and uh, actually my jaw kind of hit the floor, and I wondered if the same colleague would have defended the uh, Iraq invasion of Kuwait on the basis of Iraq saying that they have national interest. Uh, one comment on Afghanistan, uh, Karzai is gone soon. It's probably a good development for the region. I hope, and I want to say, I hope that the United States is committed to the bilateral security agreement. I think we are. Hopefully the new president there signs that, and we can move forward. I want to talk about Iraq. I obviously have been very critical of the pullout of Iraq, but uh, without revisiting that, we are where we are today. I want to ask you, Mr. Secretary, how you see the situation in Iraq today with ISIS, and then specifically from your department's perspective, I know there's still a robust state presence in Iraq. Uh, what are the challenges state faces there? What are some of the needs? And uh, as members of Congress, what can we be aware of to ensure that we can resist uh, Iraq going in a place that we don't want it to go? Well, Congressman, thank you very much. Thank you for your service, uh, which I really respect enormously. Uh, and um, I'm grateful to you for the question. Iraq is, is in a fragile place, but it's not. Iraq would have been in a fragile place no matter what, because <clears throat> it was, uh, you know, turned topsy turvy through the war where you had a Sunni minority that for centuries, I mean really for centuries, had, had governed uh, at the expense of the Iraq, of the Shia minor, majority, vast majority, and um, suddenly that was reversed, and all of a sudden you not only had that reversal, but you had an Iranian nexus that was accented in this connection, which raised the suspicions of the rest of Sunni world, a lot of other nations in the region, uh, and it exacerbated a divide in terms of this competition for influence, Iran, Iran and its influence. And now with Syria, that's been even more complicated because you have the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, which is pulling people out of Iraq, and you've got a certain amount of Iraqis in Syria as part of this uh, sectarian uh, conflict. And so um, it's fragile, and, and that's what's happened in, uh, in uh, Fallujah and in uh, you know, Ramadi and so forth, is, is this uh, resurgence of uh, the sectarianism in its most violent form. Now, uh, there's, there, that's complicated by the way in which, unfortunately, the government has chosen to govern without an inclusivity that is necessary, without resolving some of the age-old issues of the Constitution and the oil and so forth, the oil revenues. And then, of course, you have the Kurds uh, cutting their own deals on the side with Turkey or elsewhere. And there's just a lot of tensions pulling at each other. So it's very fragile right now. It's a fragile moment. You have flights coming out of Iran, which we continually talk to the Prime Minister about, that need to be that should be stopped. They're not. Uh, there's an occasional inspection, which is a phony inspection, uh, in which people are tipped off and it doesn't really do anything. So uh, we're pushing very hard. We have an outstanding ambassador, Ambassador Beecroft on the ground. We have an outstanding Assistant Secretary, Brett McGurk, who is constantly out there working very, very hard at this personally. Vice President Biden is on the phone. I'm on the phone. We're deeply involved. Uh, in trying to push these issues into a place where they can be resolved and where we pull the government along to reach out and govern more effectively and resolve some of these kinds of issues. I am convinced personally every one of these issues would be on the table no matter whether there were a few troops there or 1,000, 10,000, whatever. The troops aren't the difference. Iraq has to resolve Iraq's future, and the Iraqis have to do that. We go now thing to, ultimately will have to happen in Afghanistan. We go now to Joe Kennedy from Massachusetts. 
Mr. Secretary, good to see you again. Thank you for uh, your extraordinary service to our country um, in many forms, as my colleague just indicated. I uh, wanted to ask you, uh, just follow up really on comments from my colleagues in three areas, if I can. Um, first and foremost, Egypt. Uh, we've heard some very troubling press reports even just this week. Washington Post had a, a very troubling article, I believe it was on Monday, uh, indicating uh, thousands of ordered that were uh, uh, arrested, thousands held and, uh, without charge. Um, it was happening, I think a direct quote, they are just putting people in jail and it's happening all at once. Uh, obviously, Mr. Secretary, this is uh, an issue that strikes us here at home. Uh, Congressman Smith referenced your former constituent when you were a senator in Massachusetts and now my constituent, um, Colin Bauer, and how that's affecting U.S. interests. So if you can just uh, give us a little bit of a, a forecast as to what you see going on in Egypt and really uh, how we can be even or more effective going forward. Two, uh, building off uh, Mr. Kinzinger's question about Afghanistan and the BSA, uh, if you can shine any light as to how those negotiations are going, um, and three, or if they're going at all at this point. And then three, uh, this committee had a hearing uh, about eight months ago or so uh, after the conflict in Mali. And I was struck by, the, as you are probably well aware, the median age in Mali is about 16, in Niger it's 15. Um, throughout much of Northern Africa, it's in the late teens, early 20s. And as you move eastward, um, including the area along the Mediterranean, you're getting to close to 200 million people with the median ages in the late, uh, well, in the early 20s or so. What can we be doing from a long-term perspective to make sure we are not having hearings about crises, whether it's Algeria or Mali, whether it's seizures over oil rigs or attempted coups, to make sure that there's a long-term strategy put in place for the long-term development of not just this region, but the world? Thank you. Well, uh, Congressman, that last question is, a, is the big question that all of us need to be dealing with and coping with. President Obama is analyzing that now and has asked us to look at it very, very closely and help to design uh, the agenda. I'm pushing my people to do that. We are, we are really intensely focused on this question of huge populations in these volatile areas under the age of 30. You said the median age is 15, but huge, 60 percent under the age of 30. 50 percent under the age of 21 and so forth, uh, or less, or more, excuse me. Now, if they don't have jobs and they don't have opportunity and they are disenfranchised and the only thing available to them is radical extreme Islam, religious extremism, et cetera, uh, we got a long road ahead of us, all of us. And uh, therefore, we have to think carefully about how much it is in our security interest as well as in our long-term economic interest to be trying to get ahead of this and deal with it in ways now, which we have done effectively in various places historically, and we're not doing it there. Just very quickly on Egypt, uh, on the BSA, uh, there's an article today somewhere, uh, you know, President, uh, President Karzai has basically uh, attached conditions to the signing of it. It's not an issue. The BSA is negotiated. He's not trying to change a word in it. He's simply refusing to sign it unless X, Y, and Z happens in the country, and the things he's chosen to have happen are not going to happen uh, easily, if at all, and they're out of our control. So each of the candidates running for president has said they support the BSA, they will sign it, and, and I expect it will be signed at some point in time, if not by Karzai, by one of them. Egypt is very, very uh, challenging right now. It is vital that the interim government take measures in order to permit young people to be able to demonstrate, people to be able to take part in the political system. We cannot be arresting activists. We cannot see journalists arrested. Those things so need to change. I hope they will. We would like to see them be successful. It is vital to all of us that Egypt be successful. And we need uh, one quarter of the Arab world to find its footing now and get a government in place, move to this democratic process, stabilize, hopefully, and uh, begin to develop. But there are very troubling issues that need to be resolved with in terms of people's rights and protections in, in, in Egyptian society. We have enough time for uh, Mr. Holding. If you take two minutes to ask your questions, and then Mr. Lowenthal take two minutes to ask your question, uh, we'll allow the Secretary to respond, and then we know yeah, he has his appointment. George? Yes, sir. The, um, usually by the time it gets to me, Mr. Secretary, all the important topics have been covered at least twice. But conspicuously, we haven't talked about 
the world's largest democracy um, today. The, you know, as you know, within a month or so, almost 800 million people are going to go to the polls and choose a new government in India. Wall Street Journal recently said that the Congress Party will suffer more than likely an overwhelming defeat, and um, uh, more than likely the BJP Party will form a government with Narimunde Modi at the uh, head of it. What, what are you doing to put us in a good place with our relations with India, with the BJP government, and uh, how much do you think we will have um, as a setback um, the issue with Modi's visa status and us denying a visa to him? Um, and where, where do you see that we sit with that right now? Well, I'm not, going to, uh, I'm not going to comment on that part of it, if you don't mind, simply because it's, it's before the election, and I don't want anything I say here to have any to play into the election in any way that it should or shouldn't. Um, we respect that democracy, respect India. We have worked hard to get over the hiccup we had recently with respect to a diplomat in New York. Uh, our assistant secretary has just returned from a trip to India. Uh, we are very, very anxious, a very important relationship, a very, very vital country in terms of the, the region and globally, and we need to, uh, we have big issues to work on together. If I could ask so, you one quick question in the last 16 seconds. Do you yeah. disagree with Israel's assessment that the weapons recently um, intercepted were coming from Iran? No, I don't, based on the superficial evidence, but we want to pin things down in terms of legal, but no, I don't. Mr. Lowenthal. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for joining us and for spending so much time. And I'll shorten my questions. We sometimes provide assistance to countries with startling human rights uh, records. We've talked much about, about that today. For example, I'm most interested in that the government of Vietnam has been ranked as one of the ten worst countries for press freedom. In addition, Vietnam has undertaken an authoritarian and democratic assault on Internet freedoms, on censoring, on restricted usage of the Internet. How do we balance, Mr. Secretary, our goals of stability and, pros and prosperity for developing countries with our duty to protect the human rights of all people? So, for example, what are we doing to leverage what was in this budget, the increased economic de development Assi developmental assistance to Vietnam with our goal that they should begin to end human rights violations. Is there a balance? And the second question has to do with overseas security for uh, employee engagement. Post Benghazi, we had a hearing here. The Department of State made a number of efforts to improve the physical security of our foreign service employees overseas. However, over the years, our diplomatic presence, as we've heard, has become more difficult, more employees become less, find it that they are less accessible, and employees are working out of facilities are finding it more difficult to actually engage in the contacts with their locals. What is the department doing to ensure that employees can continue to engage and do the work that they've really been sent overseas to do? How can they raise and even challenge what they feel sometimes to be overly onerous security requirements? Well, Congressman, uh, that's a really good question, and it takes a little longer to answer than I have, so I'm going to submit uh, much of it in writing. But I will say to you, we are constantly working this issue. We are deeply concerned about it ourselves. There is a trade-off and a balance between right. security and the ability to get out and do the job. So we're providing more security. And we I can't tell you, we have a a number of embassies where people are working in very difficult uh, circumstances, mm -hmm. uh, and we've been comp we've been sort of receded to compounds in certain places rather than people being able to live out in the community and so forth. These are the risks that we live with today. So we have increased Marine Guard protection. We have increased. We have tighter rules about movement. We have certain restrictions in certain places. It's very difficult, something the committee ought to be, you know, might look at in detail at some point in time. Uh, it costs more, and that's part of the budget challenge here, to keep that presence out there and keep people being out there. We have higher costs for security, higher costs for the physical structures, higher costs for the deployments. Uh, some of them are now hardship uh, deployments where the families don't follow. Uh, you know, it's unaccompanied uh, tour. Those are difficult. So all of this is, uh, you know, 
more expensive and more complicated administrative headaches, and we need to talk through how we're going to manage it. On Vietnam, um, we are deepening our relationship and working hard. I just was there not so long ago uh, and working on a number of initiatives together. President Obama and President Tsang announced a comprehensive partnership initiative. But the truth is, and we're very clear about it, Every meeting we have, we talk about human rights and raise cases and talk about the needs to move forward. Uh, Vietnam uh, still has authorities who are uh, excessively restrictive of political rights, excessively restraining on freedom of expression mm -hmm. uh, and on the internet and so forth. Now, there was some modest improvement during the year 20, last year, 2013, including the release of the well-known legal activist Le Cong uh, Dinh, and, um, and Vietnam signed the Convention Against Torture, and there was an increase in Protestant church registrations, church. When I went there, most recently, I went to Mass in, uh, in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, and it was a pretty normal kind of event. It, it was not, uh, you know, didn't create the stir it might have uh, some years ago. So, um, we think we can make more progress. They have more to do. To their credit, they are listening and they are working at it. You know, the pace we think could be picked up, but there, there is a slow progress. Mr. Chairman, I got to. Well, we understand, Mr. Secretary. We thank you for your time today and we uh, wish you luck on your trip. And let me share with the members here that the record remains open for any members to submit questions. Uh, again, um, we thank the members for their participation. Again, thank you, Mr. Secretary. We stand adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Congressman Engel. Thank you.